So this is trademark three, priority, procedures, and incontestability. So here's our list of things uh, that we're going to cover uh, in this one. Uh, I am priority, trademark procedures, and incontestability. So let's start with priority. So the basic idea here is that when you have competing uses of a mark, mark the same mark or a very, very similar mark, um, we have basically a priority rule. This will be familiar to you from, uh, for example, patent law, where um, there is a priority rule. The first one to invent something, first one to publish something, um, is the one who gets the patent when there are simultaneous uh, inventions of, uh, of the same product. Trademark is similar. Um, competing uses of the mark are generally determined by a first use standard. So the basic idea here is the first one to use the mark um, is the one who gets uh, the mark uh, uh, as their own. Um, in, federal, in the federal context, which is of course what most of what we're talking about uh, in this course, you either use it in commerce or you register it with intent to use in commerce. So the case here is Zazu versus L'Oreal, and the question is whether ZHD, Zazu Hair Designs, which is a local uh, hair salon in Illinois, um, used the, the mark Zazu in commerce prior to L'Oreal's uses of, of Zazu. Zazu uh, L'Oreal was apparently planning and actually did launch a line of uh, hair care products directed at teens using the Zazu mark. Um, ultimately, it failed, but nonetheless, they uh, arguably infringed uh, what Zazu said was their um, uh, trademark, and therefore, they, uh, at the district court level, were told they owed damages. So L'Oreal is, a, is uh, appealing here. And um, uh, ZHD uh, made a few samples, a few sales with uh, plain bottles with their business card uh, taped to it, minimal out-of-state shipments, um, not to the public. The question is whether that provides them priority over L'Oreal, um, who made, who registered their mark and then made some small interstate shipments in 1986. So the rules here are under the common law, the first to be in the market, usually substantial sales is the requirement, it is the one who gets priority. Under the Lanham Act, uh, that changes a little bit because of the registration procedure. And what the court says is now that there is registration available, we don't need to see as much sales because you just need to have the minimal amount of sales to make it in commerce or an intent to use it uh, in commerce uh, within the prescribed time period. Um, and the reason for that is, uh, as the court explains, primarily through notice. Um, that, that it used to be under the common law that you would have to have a substantial amount of sales because you needed to provide notice to people that you claim the mark as your own, that the mark, what it, what the mark was, how it was covering things and so forth. Um, and now under registration, you do that by registering your mark, not simply by, um, uh, shipping your product, although you can still ship your product, of course. So what the court finds is that L'Oreal's April 1986 steps where they registered and then uh, did a small batch of sales to comply with the use and commerce requirement uh, was enough to provide them registration. Um, and ZHD's minimal prior sales, which are basically these sales with some plain bottles uh, with the, the business card, some out-of-state shipments, but these out-of-state shipments weren't to the public. They weren't public sales in the ordinary sense. They were more akin to samples. They were shipping them in bottles that either weren't uh, finished bottles or they were bottles that didn't contain the ingredients so they wouldn't be available um, or they wouldn't be allowed to sell it that way uh, in any event. So uh, what the court decides is that uh, the uh, that L'Oreal did enough and ZHD did not do enough and therefore ZHD was n did not have priority and did not have the claim. Um, the court describes uh, the importance of registration as a notice function and, and therefore um, it thought that what ZHD was doing, which is really minimal amounts, um, as in fact bad faith. And, and the court went on at some length about how 
to allow um, uh, circumstances such as what ZHD did to essentially uh, create trademarks would cause all sorts of potential problems because people wouldn't know when trademarks were made. If you were allowed to essentially get effective protection over the Zazu mark by simply making a few random sales here and there, um, then that's going to cause the court thought no end of mischief. Much better would be to prioritize and to allow um, to go forward uh, the trademarks that have been nationally registered and then of course as we're going to talk about uh, later on in this class there once you when you register you're subject to a number of uh, proceedings um, as well as notice um, and so because of that um, the court viewed what ZHD was doing is, is de facto bad faith and in fact noted that ZHD appeared to sort of accelerate its process of these small sales um, uh, in response to uh, L'Oreal making inquiries about whether they were in the business of hair care products. By contrast, the district court and the dissenter in this case um, seem to believe that L'Oreal was in bad faith because L'Oreal was very careful about getting licenses um, for other related marks, but for Zazu, they seem to just plow ahead um, without uh, trying to license the mark or otherwise doing um, any any significant due diligence in this regard, and the court thought that you know it was relatively clear that uh, that Zazu had the mark, and in fact Zazu, although the majority says that it wasn't registered, it, it only wasn't registered at the federal level. In fact, Zazu had been registered as a business name in Illinois, so it was certainly not like it wasn't findable for L'Oreal if they uh, looked into it. So which one is correct? I think it sort of depends on your view. This uh, uh, case was written by Judge Easterbrook, who takes a pretty economically oriented view, which I think is why uh, there's so much in it about the benefits of registration as far as notice goes. Um, and in his view, in sort of a, a strict economic view, um, forcing people or privileging people who do registration is important to the operation of the system because it provides better notice and people can structure their activities accordingly. So uh, intent to use trademarks um, uh, is something we've mentioned briefly in the course, but assuming an application um, is otherwise allowable, for an intent to use mark, the trademark office will issue a notice of allowance, but not register the mark. After the notice of allowance, the trademark owner has six months, which can be extended in some cases, to submit a statement that the trademark has been in fact used in commerce, at which point is in, it is entered on the principal register. Um, if the trademark owner doesn't submit the statement, the mark is abandoned and of course can be reused by somebody else. So. This allows for companies who are planning to use a mark to go ahead and get the registration, which as Judge Easterbrook notes in the Zazu case, is something we actually really want them to do um, without having actually shipped their products yet, as long as they, within a particular time period, do in fact ship products um, and make use of the mark, then they can go ahead and get that earlier priority date um, and have nationwide uh, registration under the federal law. So it's very common uh, for companies to get intent to use marks, um, which are then registered essentially as soon as you file the affidavit saying you've gone ahead and used it. Geographic limits. So common law trademarks, otherwise referred to as state law trademarks, don't confer nationwide protection, of course, unless you use them, use them everywhere. Um, the idea was that trademarks are only um, uh, active in the areas in which there is the, the source identification function, which would be primarily in the areas, well actually almost only in the areas uh, in which the uh, goods and services are actually sold. Um, there are a couple of exceptions. One is if your reputation exceeds the scope of your sale. So if you for whatever reason may sell only in a small area, but you have a nationwide reputation or a broader reputation, then the trademark can be enforceable in that broader range anywhere where your reputation has significant uh, pull. And the other exception to this geographic uh, uh, limitation under the common law 
was that anywhere that sales could be expected to expand. So if you were in California and you could be expected to move into Nevada, for example, or something like that, then uh, you would also get uh, protection for your mark in, in the areas in which it would be expected that you would expand. This, of course, changes now with federal registration because now you have nationwide protection. Um, now, there are a couple of issues that arise as a result of nationwide protection. The first uh, is, uh, uh, well, simultaneous use becomes an issue. So let's assume that two parties are using the mark uh, at the same time. If neither party is registered on the federal register, then the common law rules of priority control, which almost always means the first person to use the mark um, is the one who's, who's going to get priority in the particular area. Um, again, areas defined um, under the common law way of doing it. So it may be that, that there's very little actual physical overlap uh, in the areas in which the pro goods or services are sold, in which case that's not much of a problem. Um, but the common law will control if neither party is registered. If one party is registered, then the registering party will usually win again because of nationwide um, uh, presumptive use. Um, sometimes if the non-registered trademark owner can show that they had priority in, in a particular area of the country, um, say a state or a municipality or something like that, then they can uh, sometimes get a, um, uh, a, an exception, a limited territorial exception to use their mark, use the mark within that, that smaller zone. Um, so that's similar to the Amazon versus Amazon.com, Amazon bookstore versus Amazon.com uh, issue in uh, Minneapolis, where the bookstore continues to have the right to protect its mark within uh, the Minneapolis area, but Amazon.com gets to use it essentially everywhere else. If both parties are registered, then the trademark office will try to work this out. Uh, they'll declare what's generally known as an interference, where they're going to determine issues of priority. Um, they're going to try to figure out whether there's real likelihood of consumer confusion, whether the, the areas overlap in terms of geography, whether the products, uh, how close the products are to each other. Um, and so it may be that one of the marks gets canceled as a result, um, or it may be that the trademark uh, office determines that uh, one mark gets nationwide, the other mark gets a smaller territory, or they split it in some way um, in order to try to avoid any consumer confusion. So that's how we sort of interact the, ge the traditional geographic limits of trademark with the modern on approach to of trademark office marks. procedures. Uh, we've got a few things to, to cover here. One is the distinction between the principal versus the supplemental register. The principal register is what we think of as the register. Um, that's the list of all trademarks that have met the qualifications for uh, registrability in the United States. They have all of the benefits of nationwide notice, of nationwide enforceability, uh, and so forth. That's the real register. The supplemental register is there because basically of our obligations under international treaties, which obligate us to allow the registration of marks um, that are uh, available to be registered in other jurisdictions, other countries, um, but may not meet the standards for the principal register. So supplemental marks might be enforceable. It would depend. They might be enforceable as common law marks, for example. Um, uh, they might be enforceable because they get secondary meaning over time or something like that. Um, but they don't have any of the advantages of registration. They don't have the nationwide enforceability, the nationwide notice. Uh, they can't become in, un, incontestable and so forth. They are there um, to allow um, primarily uh, so that the U.S. can say that we have a system for uh, registration of marks uh, that are registrable anywhere else in the world can also be registered in the U.S. Um, doesn't mean they're fully enforceable in the U.S. It just means they can be registered uh, in the U.S. So among the ways that you can um, uh, deny registration um, for a trademark, that the trademark office can deny registration for a mark, in addition to the um, issues we've already talked about in the course in, uh, in terms of whether it's distinctive, 
um, whether it's generic, those sorts of things. Um, the, uh, the statute provides that immoral and scandalous marks, immoral, scandalous, or disparaging marks cannot be registered. Um, just in the last year, um, the Supreme Court has invalidated that provision. Um, uh, the court was slightly split on what that was. The Half the court thought it was viewpoint discrimination. Half the court thought it was overreaching and violative of uh, more general First Amendment principles. Whichever rationale you choose doesn't really matter. This essentially um, got rid of the immoral and scandalous marks uh, prohibition. Um, this had over time resulted in lots of marks being denied registration or canceled on various bases. Um, but this is gone now, so uh, not a not a an objection to the registration of a mark on the basis of it being immoral or scandalous. Geographic indicators. So geographic indicators are marks which include something about um, could something about geography in it. It might be a place. Um, it might be a um, uh, region, it might be a state, city, whatever, some geographic indication as part of the mark. Um, these are typically thought to be ordinary trademarks, but uh, as we will see in a moment, certification and collective marks uh, also have a special uh, place when it comes to uh, geographic indicators. So in general, um, the courts and, and the trademark law generally has been suspicious of allowing the registration of geographic uh, marks. Um, and that is primarily because of competition concerns, right? So the idea here is if, if I'm the only one who can um, uh, register Philly cream cheese, um, then I get a lot of competition and adv competitive advantage over other manufacturers of cream cheese in the Philadelphia area. Um, and that that can continue um, to cause competition concerns, which again is a major thing that we're concerned about uh, in the context of trademark law. Um, and I think that's the main reason. There's also a consumer deception issue um, that comes up, which is what if my Philly cream cheese is not in fact made in Philadelphia? Is that something that we want to allow? Is that something that maybe if we don't really care very much uh, whether or not uh, it happens, whether or not we want to actually allow um, uh, companies to take advantage of that situation. So that's another aspect of why traditionally the courts and the law have been relatively reluctant to allow um, the registration of, um, of any sorts of geographic indicators. Um, the rules here are in 1052E, um, and so no trademark by which the goods of the applicant may be distinguished from the goods of others shall be refused registration unless it consists of a mark and then the key components here are um, when used in on or in a connection with the goods of the applicant is primarily geographically descriptive of them, except as indications of real general origin may be registered under claims 1054. We'll talk about that in a minute. Or when used in or on connection with the goods of the applicant is primarily geographically deceptively misdescriptive. Right. So what actually happens here is essentially a three-tiered um, uh, regime. And you've got marks that are primarily geographically descriptive. Um, and so what that means is that they are primarily describing the source, the location uh, where the mark uh, was made, manufactured, came from. Right? Um, these are not registrable. These are essentially treated as descriptive marks. And so they're not registrable unless you show secondary meaning. Um, Another tier is primarily geographically misdescriptive, right? So this is saying um, uh, that what you are doing is you've got a geographic indicator in your mark, but it is misdescriptive of the geography. And it's misdescriptive in a way that that's its primary effect. So nobody would believe that you're good or service is actually from the geographic area um, and therefore it's a 
primarily geographically misdescriptive mark, and that is registrable because it is essentially the same thing as an arbitrary or fanciful mark. You're just arbitrarily choosing a particular geography that no one would really associate with your um, good or service, and uh, therefore it's, it's registrable as inherently distinctive, just like any other arbitrary uh, mark would be. A third category, which is not registrable at all, is if it's deceptively misdescriptive, primarily geographically deceptive, deceptively misdescriptive. And what that is, is um, that it, the mark is not, the geographic term of the mark is not describing where the goods are from, but it's deceptive in the sense that consumers would primarily believe that it might actually be from that place. And so this gets to the consumer concern um, that we were talking about earlier, this consumer confusion concern, uh, where you are essentially tricking consumers um, by leading them to believe that something came from a particular uh, location when in fact it doesn't and you cannot register a mark um, that has that effect on consumers. So in the Nantucket case, this was um, a question about whether the Nantucket Reds collection um, was allowed to be uh, registrable. And so the question is, is this a primarily geographically descriptive? Is it geographically misdescriptive or is it deceptively misdescriptive? And the court finally, it, the court decides that it is geographically misdescriptive because no one would reasonably, the consuming public would not reasonably believe that the Nantucket's red meant that these clothing items were all made in Nantucket and therefore it was primarily misdescriptive of the geography and was therefore registrable. What about Nantucket nectars? Right? I actually think that Nantucket Nectars is a potentially closer case because it might be that you believe that the water, for example, or the, um, the location of the bottling company um, might in fact be in Nantucket. Um, and if that was the case, um, then it would be deceptively misdescriptive because, of course, it's not uh, in uh, Nantucket and would be not registrable. Um, if it is from Nantucket, um, then it is geographically descriptive and they would have to show secondary meaning if in fact it's not from Nantucket and uh, we don't believe that consumers would associate it with Nantucket at all then it is geographically misdescriptive and would be registrable uh, as such. Vineyard vines uh, again I think this is geographically misdescriptive and should be relatively easy to register Again, for the reasons that Nantucket Reds were, were found to be not um, geographically descriptive or deceptively misdescriptive, uh, most consumers would not consider um, that these uh, clothing items were made on um, Martha's Vineyard. Um, again, it might be suggestive um, in a way. Um, because there are the, you know, they are certainly trying to trade off on a particular style um, that is uh, the Northeast Coast uh, style or something, um, but it is uh, probably uh, going to be held misdescriptive and therefore easily uh, registrable. In fact, you can even see the little trademark symbol uh, in the graphic there. So the big exception to that sort of relatively straightforward three-tier process is uh, geographic indicators uh, in the context of uh, collective or certification marks. Um, and there, we in fact do allow geographic indicators that are descriptive um, to be registered quite easily. Um, and uh, and so like Idaho potatoes, that's descriptive of where the potatoes come from. We allow that to be registered because it's a collective mark rather than um, a traditional trademark. Um, the idea being that if you didn't allow that, then it would make it hard to have collectives um, or certifications, usually it's collectives here, um, that were um, 
that were geographically based, which many of them are, right? So the reason to allow um, uh, Idaho potatoes as a mark is because that strengthens um, the ability of the farmers of Idaho, the state of Idaho, to market their goods um, in a coherent fashion and trade off the goodwill of their products. Uh, and so that's um, why we uh, why we allow um, uh, these descriptive marks to be um, uh, registered. Um, and so these, uh, as long as they can show some level of secondary meaning, um, they can uh, register. You can easily register uh, geographically descriptive marks as certification marks and sometimes as collective marks. So Washington apples is an example. Idaho potatoes is an example. Um, Vidalia onions uh, is an example. Um, the, this is a sort of hot international trade issue uh, because um, in the U.S., as I sort of introduced at the beginning, we're actually quite reluctant to allow geographic indicators or geographic marks at all to be registered, to be protected as trademarks because of our significant competition concerns. Internationally, they feel quite differently about this. Um, they're particularly in areas of Europe where things like wine and cheese and meats um, are all very geographically oriented. So protecting a geographic indicator for allowing um, these uh, sort of regional uh, uh, differences between the wines and the meats and the cheeses and so forth to be marketed as such is much more important uh, in Europe and they're much more serious uh, about that. Um, and so there's sort of a constant tension between the European approach which would extend protection to a lot more geography, a lot more geographic indicators, especially as collective marks, whereas in the U.S. it's viewed as a fairly minor exception to our general rule that we don't like to allow um, uh, the registration of geographic indicators. And in fact, in the U.S., we treat geographic indicators as a form of certification mark. Um, we use standard trademark principles. They have to show the standard things and so forth. Internationally, they take a bit um, uh, of a different approach. And the debate is essentially, are they you know, uh, reducing search costs and therefore enhancing consumer welfare by allowing people to find, for example, Idaho potatoes? Um, or are they just restraining competition, right? If you don't belong or if you don't certify your, your farm as, as meeting the Idaho potato standard, you can't compete, right? You can't compete effectively against the people who do. So this is the question. It's sort of a, a question about whether or not um, uh, the uh, advantages of allowing the, um, uh, the marketing and the potential reduction in, in consumer search costs outweighs the possibility that these collectives, these organizations, or the marks themselves may, um, uh, may interfere with competition. Surnames. So surnames are considered descriptive marks. We are very reluctant to allow them um, to be registered. Um, if you can show secondary meaning, which can often be quite hard, of course, in the context of surnames, um, then you can register them, but only under those circumstances. The courts are hesitant here, again, because of competition concerns. There's traditional notions that if you're selling goods or services or you have a store or whatever, you should be allowed to use your own name to describe your goods. Right? I should be allowed to say Wagner's Baked Goods or Wagner's Burgers. And frankly, even if my name is McDonald, it's seen, you know, traditionally we would say I can, I can call my burger stand McDonald's Burger Stand or something like that. Now, the reality is I probably wouldn't be able to in modern trademark law, but traditionally we have allowed a lot of latitude for people to um, use their surnames when they were uh, selling goods. And that meant they are very reluctant, very, very um, uh, limited, limited amounts of registration for certain surnames. Opposition, Opposition proceedings. proceedings. 
So, so within, within 30, 30 days, days um, that you, you uh, uh, the announced, announced that uh, particular, particular registration, uh, a mark may be opposed to the trademark, the trademark. So you can file, file any, any reason that a mark could have been objected to the trademark office is also a fair game. game. The trademark the office will then essentially look at the preceding pre-registration from the trademark that was properly granted. Because it has a 30-day limit, when you can do this, it is only only for the use of the use of the for companies that have the money, the money to have somebody to monitor on it gets registered at all times. Um, and so it's not a particularly useful um, uh, proceeding uh, generally. What is much more useful is a cancellation proceeding, which is also allowable, but it's allowable beyond the 30 days. And even more importantly, it's allowable in the context of a federal lawsuit. So if somebody sues me for infringement, of their um, trademark, I can, as in one of my defenses, um, uh, ask for, actually as a counterclaim, I guess it would be, ask for the cancellation of the mark um, because it doesn't meet the registration requirements for um, uh, whatever reason I, I raise. So that uh, then allows for very similar um, to the effect of having the invalidity of a patent being an issue in any patent lawsuit, the cancellation, that is sort of the uh, registration status of a trademark can often, not always, but often be an issue in a trademark infringement case as well. So that's an important aspect of proceedings uh, in trademark law as well. And finally, for this class, uh, let's cover incontestability. Um, the key case here is Park and Fly versus Dollar Park and Fly, but it's really um, just the framework for understanding what incontestable mean. An incontestable mark um, in, under the Lanham Act is, a, is one that has been registered and in continuous use for at least five consecutive years. Uh, in order to show that, you basically have to file an affidavit uh, with the Patent and Trademark Office saying that you have in fact used your mark in commerce for five consecutive years um, uh, and, uh, and then you your mark becomes incontestable. Once it's incontestable, um, many of the reasons that would otherwise allow the mark to be canceled, um, which often come up as defenses in the trademark infringement because, uh, as I noted earlier, a cancellation proceeding um, or a cancellation claim is often attached to a trademark infringement claim. Um, your ability to argue for cancellation becomes much more limited once a mark has become incontestable. And the question in the park and fly case is whether or not a claim of descriptiveness is barred for an incontestable mark. The mark had become incontestable, but now the trademark defendant is arguing that in fact the claim is, uh, or that the, the mark is in fact descriptive of the goods or services um, rather than suggestive, uh, which was the basis upon which it was originally registered. So the majority here concludes that descriptiveness cannot be raised in inst against an incontestable mark um, as a matter of statutory construction and legislative intent. This is sort of a very detailed um, textual and intent-based analysis rather than one based on larger questions of policy. The dissent takes up, Justice Stevens takes up the, the question of policy and saying it clearly can't be right um, that Congress intended for descriptive marks um, to continue to be registered even when they're known to be descriptive. Um, and so that can't be what, on, what incontestability allows um, under, and, and he has, again, stat both statutory language, um, intent of Congress, and um, he describes policy reasons uh, for that. But he lost. Uh, that was a dissent. Um, Justice O'Connor in the majority here concluded that uh, incontestability limits and prevents the assertion of descriptiveness against uh, such marks. And therefore, um, there is no ability um, to cancel a mark on that ground once it becomes incontestable. So that's it for now. Um, and we will move on next to infringement issues uh, for trademark four.